Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Vincent Birutu. I'm the head of the energy unit at uh, EASME. And uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our TED speaker tonight. But before I do that, please let me say a few words about the Manage Energy Initiative, which is inviting you tonight. It is a, a European Commission initiative uh, dedicated to local and regional energy agencies. Today in Europe, we've got around 300 energy agencies. They employ more than 2,500 people, and these people play a key role in meeting our European energy and climate goals. And through their ability to work with many stakeholders, citizens, businesses, administrators, politicians, they develop a wide range of sustainable energy projects, and they enable large-scale investments in their regions. So through Manage Energy, the European Commission wants to enhance their role and provide the agencies with tools and capacity to lead the energy transition. And to this end, Manage Energy has uh, successfully delivered master classes on project development, financing, and it's trained nearly 100 energy agency staff from 22 countries. More master classes are in the pipeline focusing on innovative financing, role of banks, and new approaches and tools for financing investments. In addition, we've got managed energy experts who are available to visit energy agencies, meet their staff, the stakeholders, and offer tailor-made support uh, for developing new services or boosting the existing ones. And we've got seven expert missions uh, that have taken place already in seven countries and are 15 more in the pipelines. But Manage Energy not only wants to uh, support the ambitions of energy agencies, uh, but also to inspire others uh, to drive investments and actions on sustainable energy. And this is exactly uh, the focus of the Manage Energy talks. And after our first edition last year during the European Sustainable Energy Week with the, the founder of the transition movement, Rob Hopkins, we have the pleasure now to host our next state speaker, who is Per Espen Stockness. And I, I'm very delighted to introduce him uh, because, uh, first of all, he has a somewhat unusual background. Uh, he's a psychologist and an economist. He is director of the Center for Green Growth at the Norwegian Business School. He also served as a member of the Norwegian Parliament. And if that was not enough, he's also an entrepreneur. And he also funded energy uh, company, clean energy companies. In his research, Per Espen has spent years studying the defenses that we all use to avoid thinking about climate change. And he's here to share with us how to transform apocalypse fatigue into action on global warming. Ladies and gentlemen, please a round of applause for Per Espen. Thanks so much. Very glad to be here. And uh, a little bit sorry to be the last thing between you and your cocktails. But um, we'll get there. So today I want to share with you a tailored, specially tailored version of uh, the TED talk I gave uh, for some time back now over on the um, psychology of uh, climate change. So I've been listening to you today, sitting in the back, and uh, I understood you have lots of plans and lots of great technology and lots of great metrics and lots of signatories. But how do we get people engaged in solving global warming? Not just you, but your neighbors, the colleagues at job, the um, friends you have, the thousands of people in our cities, how do we reach into their brains, their bodies, and get them on board? This is what I'm going to bring some, hopefully, fresh perspectives on. So, but it's not just me. I want you to test your own reactions. So I'd like to start. We're running two experiments, two tests on you. 
right now. Is that okay? Yeah. Your task is to notice how you feel, whether you feel any differently as I speak. Okay? Here we go. Let's turn that off. We are measuring carbon dioxide levels rising, now above 410 ppm. To avoid the RCP 8.5 scenario, we need a rapid decarbonization and actually a global energy transformation. Because the global carbon budget for hitting a two degree target with 66% likelihood is only approximately 800 gigatons. Cut. That was one. Now, let me try something else. Science tells us we're heading for an uninhabitable Earth. Monster storms, crazy floods, wild fires. Blazing sun that's gonna cook us, our economy is collapsing. You know, 2017 and 2018 was so unexpectedly warm, scientists are freaking out. We now have only two years left. Two years in which to cut emissions. If not, we're gonna live in a hell hole, a boiling earth. Cut. Now, the first condition, did you notice any difference? Maybe some detachment or confused or... And the other, did you feel fearful, unsettled, angry maybe, or just, as the English say, comfortably numb? <laughs> so again, the question I just asked, how do we get people engaged in solving global warming. And why don't those two standard ways of communicating work? You see, the biggest obstacle to solving climate change is about 15 centimeters thick. Yes, it's the gray thing between our ears. That's where it lies. And building on a rapidly, bo a rapidly growing body of psychology and social science research, I spent years drilling into those, reading more than three, four hundred scientific articles to see if we can find the five inner defenses that keep people from responding to rational climate science. It stop people from engaging. Because when people hear about the climate news coming kind of straight at them, the first inner defense in our brains comes often straight up, and that's called distance in the psychological return, psychological distancing. Because when we hear about the climate, it's usually something very far away in time. We speak about the year 2050, 2030, 2100. It's even very far out in space. We use images of melting glaciers or polar bears, or it's a hurricane in the Pacific. People hit are usually very far away from me. It's also very abstract and slow moving. We have to think in gigatons, in ppm's, centuries, and the planet. Very big things. So what the brain gets then, our kind of more reptile brain gets, it's, it's not here and it's not now. And since it seems so far away from me, also, it seems outside my scope of influence. It doesn't really matter what I do. I can't do anything that makes a difference. So, our brain, evolutionary, has developed to focus more on the nearer things. And we do so on to do as today as well. Typically, we prefer focusing on, like, our children, our jobs, or maybe how many likes we get on uh, Facebook or Insta. Oh, that's real. Next comes doom. Because climate change, as it has been conventionally communicated,
is full of looming catastrophes, disasters, bringing losses, costs, sacrifice. This makes us usually first fearful when we hear about it, or a bit guilty. But after this first fear has arisen in our brain, then we quickly learn to avoid it. We start avoiding the messengers and the topic itself. So after 30 years of scary climate change communications, because this started already back in 1988, more than 80% of media articles show studies still have been applying the disaster framing. But people habituate, as we psychologists call it, we get used to it, it's like crying wolf wolf. And then you desensitize to this doom overuse. And many of us are therefore suffering from a kind of uh, apocalypse fatigue. And we get maybe even numb from watching too much collapse porn. You know, ice glaciers going boom, and uh, lots of cars and big pipes with exhaust going up, smokestacks. Well, the third barrier, if we get beyond distance and doom, we can say, for instance, say it's climate change is here, it's now. And we can also speak about solutions and saying we can fix this if only we go on and do something. But then the third barrier in our brain is typically dissonance. Now, dissonance is a psychological word that has very specific meaning. It refers to what arises in our brain when what we know, for instance, we learn from science and communicators that fossil fuel use is dangerous to the climate. Well, this knowledge conflicts with what we do. Because in our everyday lives, we still drive cars, we fly, we eat meat, etc. And then when I see I'm doing something that scientists say is bad, then I feel kind of like a hypocrite or feel bad about myself. This is the dissonance feeling. It's a kind of inner discomfort, really. Hardly noticeable. But the brain is very quick to respond to these kind of states. We learned it since we were pretty small. And the brain automatically, subconsciously, starts to serve up self-justifications. So I can tell myself, for instance, that, you know, well, my neighbor, he has a bigger car than I do. Or I can say, well, my colleague, she flies to Africa three times, or to Mallorca three times. I only fly once to Greece. Or I can say, well, what's the point if I'm the only one to stop eating meat? It doesn't make a dent. Or I could even say, you know, ah, this climate science thing. I know for 10,000 years ago there were glaciers and then it got warmer and there were no cars, there were no planes then. So why should the cars and the planes get the blame now? I'm not so sure about this climate science thing. Climate is always changing. If I kind of lend my ear to these kind of doubts, then it makes me feel better. And this is the kind of um, benefit of uh, letting into doubt that the dissonance goes away. So it explains a lot about the, the backlash. The more people feel bad about themselves, the larger benefit they have from doubting climate science or explaining it away. And for me, personally, my dissonance comes up when I recognize that I've been flying to Brussels today, and after this talk for 25 minutes, I'll be flying back to Oslo in order to speak about the climate for 20 minutes. Well, now on to denial. Maybe I shouldn't speak so much about this. You know. If we keep silent, if we just ignore, if we just ridicule the facts or these climate hysterics, then we may find inner refuge from fear and guilt. We lo no longer notice that we are, have a dissonance. You see, denial doesn't come from a lack of information. It doesn't come from a lack of intelligence. But it does point to a peculiar state of mind where we both can know something and not know it at the same time. It's a kind of double life. That's denial, not just saying no. It's living as if you don't know what you know. And the bad news is that humans, we're pretty good at it. So, 
particularly this is the case if my family, my neighbor, my colleagues at work, uh, we have a silent social contract that we, mm -mm, we don't speak about these things. So if you bring it up at a Christmas dinner or when going on vacation together, it makes everybody feel bad, so you really shouldn't. And it also comes across in the case that, you know, you might hear a piece of climate news today, or you might be together with your friends at Manage Energy or whatever, but by, you, know, you feel really motivated. But by, by Monday morning, we may live again as if we never heard or never knew what we did knew on Tuesday. Finally, there's identity. Because alarmed climate scientists and alarmed climate activists they demand that the government takes action, typically through more regulation, more taxes. But consider what happens when people who hold, for instance, conservative values, or free market values, hear about some activist claiming that government should interfere more, more regulations and more taxes to expand even further particularly in rich Western democracies, and particularly in Anglophone rich democracies, they are then less likely to believe the science. There's a strange correlation, actually, between speaking English and distrusting climate science. So if I hold, but it's not just there, of course, if I hold conservative values, I typically prefer big, proper cars and tiny government, rather than tiny, tiny cars and big government. And if climate science starts calling for bigger government, mm, I'm less likely to trust those scientists. So in this way, our identity, building on a set of values, start to override the facts. Or to put it in a nutshell, my identity trumps truth any day. So, after these five defenses, what can we do? What do we know really works? Because in the same about three to four hundred articles been published on this area, they've also been exploring what goes beyond those barriers and actually starts to engage people. And the key here is to flip those five defenses over into key success criteria. So when you do climate communications, you can actually match what you're doing and see, test it on how it does with those barriers and also how it tests if you flip them over to key success criteria. So let's do them. And I put the names of S's on them, sorry. Yeah. Um, first, we have to make climate more social. That might sound strange. And also, while I was listening to the panels today, what does it mean not just to speak about the technology and the financing mechanisms, but make things social? We have to bring it home to people. And the social science way of doing this is by spreading so-called social norms that are positive towards the solutions. If I believe, and a norm is a belief what others will do, if I believe that my neighbor will take action, then I will want to too. So we can see from map data, for instance, how solar roof panels spread from neighbor house to neighbor house like a virus. It's like contagious. It's like getting the flu. And this is, if you will, the power of peer-to-peer. -peer. Now, I saw this both in German data and US data, and you might have heard that Oslo, my home city, is now leading in terms of electric car adaptation. So I wondered, I had two psychologists that I supervised to have them look at how does the geographical patterns of electric vehicle uh, purchase happen? Does it happen like a random, or does it happen in a certain way? So I had them do 20,000 EV purchases and plot them on the streets, because we know the streets. And this is what we found. If it was random, then everything should be grey. But what you can see here is that in the red dots, that's streets in which one car one person got an electric car, and then the neighbor got it within 12 months. And then they kind of just spread like measles. But what about the blue, you might think? 
What about the blue scares? Well, those are the opposite. Th those are statistically significant no-go zones for electric vehicles. So there's nobody here who has an electric vehicle, and that, thus I don't want it either. It's stupid. So you have the neighborhood effect going in reverse. These things demonstrate very powerfully how if you want to engage people, you must go through the social dynamics. Let me briefly recount one more experiment with you, since I have a little bit more time than usual here, which is an experiment done by Bob Cialdini, a marketing professor. He had 4,000 households participate. The first 1,000, he asked, please save power, be energy efficient, because it's good for the Earth. It's sustainable. It's the right thing to do. And I suppose you agree, since you're here, huh? The next 1,000 households, condition two, were told, you should conserve power, be energy efficient, because of your children. Think about your children and your grandchildren. They deserve a world too. The third group were asked, you should conserve power because it's good for your wallet. It makes your power bill go down. You save money. The fourth group were told how much power they use compared to their neighbor. Now we have a very scientific setup. Is it A, because of sustainability? Is it B, because of your children or grandchildren? Is it C, because of your wallet or your economy? Or is it D, because of what the neighbor is doing? Anybody want to guess? One, two, three, or four? Four consistently. Each time we do that study, it's been replicated 15 times and it's now even a business idea called O power. So, that's why you need to work on social norms and not just the technology, not just the financing mechanism, but how do people speak about this? All right, I went a little bit over time on that one. It's so important. Then we need to flip doom by speaking more about the supportive opportunities. Rather than a lot of backfiring frames such as catastrophe, disaster, costs, sacrifice, we should speak much more about human health, preparedness, and opportunity. Those three trigger more lust and positive centers in the brain. For instance, take this. Looks like a perfect burger. It is a perfect burger, it's just that it's plant-based. Those are not... I, I chew in it, mmm, and get my teeth in, I can feel the blood. <laughs> ah, mm, the salty taste of it. Ah, lovely. It's only that it's red beets with some innovative gastronomic spices. So, if it's good for my body, it's good for the climate, then it clicks into place for much more people than just, you should go vegan. And actually, I, just, I did study on that as well with some of my students. I had a restaurant um, eliminate the labels of vegan and vegetarian, and rather than, they had the special dish of the day. And they gave this burger a kind of incredible name, like you know, Space Burger, or we had a Mexican-style tuna, whatever. It's just that it wasn't tuna, it was all plant-based. And people had, like, much more of that when it was relabeled, and it was also um, the, the default. So they don't have to think that much. Similar in terms of opportunities, uh, right now, more than 10 million jobs have been created within the renewable sphere. And to create engagement, psychological research needs, you need, shows that you need to trigger on balance three supportive opportunities for each one threat you mention. Three to one, that's the positivity ratio in psychology. So, I saw, for instance, that Siemens, up on the stage here, had a whole slide with opportunities. I think it was something called uh, comfortable, clean, safe, resilient, efficient. Yes, that's the right way of getting it, but it's all very distant and abstract. How can we bring it to a state where it psychologically triggers brain waves? You have to make it more juicy and feel near in these framings approaches. So people really want it. Now, that's the three to one balance we need. Uh, fourth, or third, a nudging. That's based on behavioral economics. So we can flip the dissonance 
by making everyday actions simpler. So with better choice architecture, we can make climate behaviors by default much more convenient and frequent. You know, the bad news about human nature is that we are inattentive, we don't think much long term, and we take self-destructive and often resource-wasting decisions. Now, the good news is that people are inattentive, that they follow just what's happening in the moment, and they will take very constructive choices if that's the default option, and they don't have to think that much. So take food waste, for instance. This study uh, looked at the effect of first putting up a sign saying, don't take more food than you need, and then they did another condition, they changed the big plate to the small plate. As you can see, it's the same amount of food, but on the li little plate it looks full, but on the big plate it looks half empty. So people put more food on, and that became food waste. So the sign had no effect, but changing the plate size made it food waste go down by 20%. And that's huge if you know how much energy goes into making food. So this nudge, smaller plates, has a big effect. And there are now hundreds of these green nudges out there, waiting to put, be put into use, particularly in the energy space. Fourth, we can flip denial by telling or giving people better feedback. The reason is that with frequent signals, we break that double life where we both know something and do not know something because we are reminded about it. And if you can provide motivating feedback, about how well people are doing in their problem solving, then motivation comes back. And this should be both as individuals, as teams, and companies and cities. Because if we only hear about PPM levels in the global atmosphere, or we hear about ocean sea level rise in centimeters per decade, mm -mm, those signals don't resonate in the brain. So maybe you have improved your transport footprint or waste less energy in your building. Maybe you get a visible smart meter showing you that. But also, you should be encouraged to sh uh, compare it with your neighbors or your friends. So one app that does this is called Ducky.echo. What you can do here is that you click for reduce food waste, vegetarian day, reduce indoor temperature, buy local vegetables, whatever. And then this can add up for a whole network. You can have one city compared to another city, or you can have one team compared to another team. And that way you trigger the social comparison dynamic. We start to combine the social and the signal. Finally, we can flip identity by better storytelling. Because our brain really loves stories. So we need better stories of where we really want to go, and we need more storytellers who are not just technicians, engineers, or finance people, but also knows how to tell a good story. Maybe that's a key competence. So, to mention one thing, for myself, I'm proud that my hometown of Oslo is now embarking on this bold journey of electrifying all transportation, whether buses, bikes, or cars. And one of the people spearheading this is my friend Christina Bu, who has been for years fighting against the anti-electric car people. Every day another slam, you know. But she stood out in it. And now, following Oslo, UK and France, India and China have all announced plans for ending the sales of fossil fuel cars. So in Oslo, we see lots of enthusiastic EV owners going back to their neighbors and their friends and telling them their stories of how, what it's like using an electric car wherever they're going. So through the story, we came full circle back to social. Now, thousands of innovative climate communicators are using these now. It's not just mine. These are emerging from the entire field of the science of science communications. So these five pragmatic solutions are evidence-based. We know they work. However, it is, of course, clear that individual actions cannot solve the climate problem. I'm not saying that, but what I'm, I'm saying is that they do build a stronger bottom-up support for the political and the structural solutions that we know can solve it. 
So, I started this talk out with um, two ways of speaking about the climate challenge. What we can call abstractionism and doomism. I'd also like to share a third way of speaking about the climate that I've been experimenting with. This goes to reimagining the climate, as we speak about all the time, as something much more closer, as the air, as this living air. Because it's not really about some abstract climate far away in the stratosphere. It's really about the air that surrounds us, that is between you all the time, right now. The air you can feel here, and the air that is moving right now in your nostrils. Yes, that's how near climate is. And this air is incredibly thin compared to the size of the Earth. Far, far thinner than the skin of an apple compared to its diameter. And when we look up on the blue day, it may look endless, but it's only about six to eight kilometers thin, a thin, fragile wrapping around this massive green, white, blue ball. And inside that skin, we're all closely connected. And the one breath that you took, yes, you, I saw you breathe, that contained 400,000 molecules of argon that Gandhi breathed as well during his lifetime. Imagine that. And inside this unsettled thin film, we're all protected, nourished, and held. It insulates and regulates temperature in this narrow band that is just suitable for water and for life as we know it. And mediating between this blue ocean, the seas, and the endless dark eternity, we have the clouds, and they carry all, all the water. Billions of tons of water needed to replenish the soils. The air fills the rivers, stirs the waters, and waters the forests. So with the global weirding of the weather, it is weird, and it is unsettling. There are many good reasons for fear and for despair and depression. Yes, there is. So I think we sometimes need to grieve that, grieve the losses and the craziness and the destruction we see. But then we can also choose to face the future with sober eyes and determination. The new psychology of climate action lies in letting go, not of science, but of the crutches of scientism and doomism. And then focus on telling the new stories of how we solve it, how we solve it together. And there are stories we need to tell about drawdown, how we reverse global warming. Through bold city action. These are the stories of companies and people, cities and countries, and public bodies that in spite of heavy, strong counterwinds, headwinds, still go on caring for the air. These are the stories of the steps we take, however small, because they ground us in who we are as humans, as earthlings in this living air. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Per Espen, for this uh, very inspiring speech, for giving us the insights on psychological barriers, but more importantly, on giving us uh, solutions uh, to overcome these barriers. I think uh, I found it very inspiring. I know you, you're supposed to leave for Norway very soon, but uh, I think you've time for a couple of questions. Sure. If anyone in the audience wants to ask uh, questions. People are very quiet. It's the end of the day. Yes. 
you could introduce yourself quickly and ask your question. My name is Carl Devaux. I'm from the... Take the microphone. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Carl Devaux. I'm from the Energy Cooperative EcoPower from Flanders and also represented, representing RESCOP EU, which is the federation of the energy cooperatives in Europe. And uh, your spy, your, thank you for your speech because you gave us with your five arguments exactly what we're doing with the energy cooperatives, reversing all the, the dooms and so on to positive action. Mm. So thank you. Thank you. Good. That's good yeah, to hear. Another, yeah. one. <laughs> another question here. Yes. Hi. My name is Eliana Rabak. I'm coming from Ukraine. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask you a question. Uh, you know, when we're talking about technology, there is such thing as penetration rate, finance, there are mechanisms and tools. What about the people? Is there such thing as a penetration rate in our psychology? How long do you think um, are we talking about a generation or two? Or is it realistically with the right neighborhood strategies um, we can really speed up the process? So you bring up what an issue that is sometimes called the social tipping points, if I heard your question correctly. How long do we have to wait before the values in terms of climate response are tipping from being a minor issue to a major issue for the majority? Is that correct? Yeah. And the honest answer, and I've been going through kind of bunches of literature looking for this question, is that we do not know. Because these social tipping points in history often have arrived after a long struggle. And, you know, in terms of slavery, in terms of women's voting rights, in terms of, uh, recently, uh, smoking issues, and in terms of also um, gay people's rights. It shows that for a long time, we seemingly get nowhere, and we struggle. Oops. And then something like in Norway, um, we have been using petroleum and plastics like, like if there was no tomorrow. And then one day a whale comes up, a huge 12 meter long whale with its stomach full of plastic. But people don't know that. It, it just kind of goes on to, and they try to get him out again, but it doesn't want to go out. And he's pulled, swims in again, and he dies on the beach. And then it's opened up with 30 plastic bags inside his stomach. And this image of the one whale has done more for environmental consciousness in Norway than maybe 15 years of, of environmental uh, discussions. And the same thing, thing with the Vietnam War, this one image of the, the girl after the napalm bombing running down the street ended the support in the USA for the Vietnam War. And also this one three-year-old child from Turkey uh, that died on the beach suddenly changed the European perception of the Syrian crisis. So, Studies of how social tipping points happens often point to unexpected, absurd situations that come after a long structural struggle seemingly getting nowhere. That is both depressing and hopeful, depending on which perspective you want to have on it. <laughs> and, and could Greta Thunberg and the school strikes be yes. that uh, tipping point? It's very interesting because I had a long Facebook discussion on this issue. Somebody like Greta Thunberg coming out of nowhere, seemingly out of nowhere. Is she, I mean, we're not far from France here. Anybody know Jean d'Arc? Huh? You know, that kind of dynamic. Suddenly somebody arises which seems to trigger a ripple effect in the social networks. And I have been speculating, but I don't want to put that on her. So um, I'm just supporting her. I think she's fantastic. Go, 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 Greta! Some, uh, I, I, I don't know how much I can, what I can do to support her. I just, <laughs> she's wonderful. She is indeed. Any other questions? If not, I mean, uh, we're a bit behind schedule, so um, I, I noted on what you said about making climate more social. Yes. And the power of peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer, yes. And that, for me, is a transition to the next uh, session, which is the networking cocktail that ah. we're all going to share. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much. Como dicen